Morning, everyone, and for some of you across the world, good morning or good afternoon. My name's Noel Hadjimichael, and I'm the chair of the Defence and Security Circle at the National Liberal Club in London. This is a wonderful opportunity for a conversation and some real quality questions and answers. I'm so thrilled that we have over 100 participants today. You've been muted for this first part of the evening, and then you'll be able to contribute to the Q&A. You will be asked to um, agree to this is being uh, recorded because you will be able to find it on our YouTube channel in a few days' time. Also, we'll be asking you to ask your questions via the chat function. Now, it's not about the introduction, it's about the show. Can I introduce Lynn O'Donnell, who will be interviewing Professor Sir David Omand. Over to you, Lynn. And you'll have to unmute yourself, Lynn. All right, here we go. Sorry about that, a little bit of a technical glitch there. Thanks, Tim. And thank you, Noel. Um, and thanks for, uh, to everybody for tuning in from wherever you are. I'm very happy to be here and um, in conversation with Sir David Oman about his book, How Spies Think. And the first question I'm going to ask you, David, is why did you write this book? What message were you trying to send us? Well, thanks, Lynn, and it's a great pleasure to be with you all this evening. I started thinking about this book um, really after watching how the Brexit referendum and then the 2016 US presidential election were being reflected in social media. And I found myself getting increasingly irritated and then angry with the way that social media was being used. And the book, my message, the book is essentially a call to arms in favour of rational analysis and rational debate, uh, analysis to support decision making. And, you know, let us take a stand against what I see as a rising tide of half-truths and distortions, ways of trying to persuade us online or so on social media of what we ought to think and want, and often trying to set one section of society against uh, uh, another. And of course, most recently, after I'd written the book, we've had the COVID-19 experience, and we've seen some of the outright falsehoods, the anti-vaccination stories, for example, conspiracy theories linking COVID-19 to 5G telephone masts and so on. And I think we're, we're in a world now where respecting the truth no longer seems quite as important as creating the desired emotional impact. It's been called the spread of truth decay. You know, I'd like it to be true becomes, if it's repeated often enough, it might be true. And that then gradually slides into, well, it's as good as true for me. And you end up, therefore, with decisions that are based on magical thinking, that the world is as you would like it to be, not how it actually is. So that's basically the message, drawing, of course, on my experience uh, in, in uh, government service. I, uh, I had seven years uh, on the Joint Intelligence Committee, and I was watching analysts, intelligence analysts, uh, grapple with these problems of what do you believe, what do you not believe? And I've tried to put that in into the book, but that's a long answer to a very good question. Then. <laughs> well, long answers are welcome, David. Thank you. Um, one of the um, uh, things that you came up with in your book is an exploration of seas, 
which you said contains an appeal, as you've just referred to, um, to rationality in all of our thinking. Can you um, explain C's as your theory and um, as your template for going forward and then um, apply it to um, intelligence as we know it, government, military, whatever intelligence, and then how can we apply this? Because this um, is what you want us to do um, if the uh, theory of your book is to be um, taken literally. Um, how do we apply C's to how we live now in the world we're living in. Yeah, the as I was writing the book, um, it became more and more apparent to me that uh, what I was describing actually applied not just to the kind of decisions that national security councils take, but to the decisions we all have to take and whether it's in business life or, or, or personal life. I mean, one way of thinking about it is this, when it comes to making an important decision, you have to bring together in your head two different kinds of thinking. On the one hand, you've probably got some bold ambitions for what you want to achieve by the choice, or it might be you've got some outcomes you fear and your decision is gonna help you avoid that. So there's, there's some emotion there, there's some passion. And on the other hand, you've got, I hope, a rational analysis of the situation you're facing and both kinds of thought, the, the passionate and the analytic are needed, but you have to bring them together. And as I was just saying a moment ago, my worry is that the emotional is beginning to distort the rational. So thinking about that, what do you need to know to take a good decision, assuming that you've been, you're in a position where you really feel you ought to, maybe you've decided you have to move house, you've got to change life partner, who knows, you've got an important decision to take. And my shorthand, my acronym SEES, S-E-E-S, -E -E is short for situational awareness, explanation, estimation, and strategic notice. And situational awareness is about answering questions about what, when, where, who. Um, it's, you know, the basic facts or data about uh, what is going on. And my first lesson in intelligence, of course, is that it's never complete your knowledge of the world is fragmentary, it's incomplete, and sometimes it's wrong, you misperceive things or people deceive you um, intentionally or unintentionally, and you just got to get used to it. But you have to start as best you can having a view of what is, what is it you're facing. But we all know that uh, the uh, data, by itself or information or intelligence reporting is dumb. You need to explain what's going on. I mean, simple example, uh, uh, this, every defense lawyer, and maybe there are some barristers in the audience I don't know, but every defense lawyer knows that you have to convince the jury of your explanation of the facts of the case. Mm and the prosecution is trying to do something rather different, their explanation. So suppose the fingerprints of the accused were on fragments of a bottle thrown at the police during a bit of a riot. Is that evidence that he threw the bottle or did the mob rushing past the front of his house simply pick the bottle out of his recycling bin and they threw it? Two different explanations, the same fact. Um, and that is true right across uh, the, the, any, any area, particularly when we're looking at the digital world and digital data, facts need explaining. And explaining is, is hard. It's the hardest part of intelligence analysis. You may see things, but can you explain why? And so explanation is answering questions that start with why or how, and generally speaking, we should be preferring the explanations with the least evidence against them, not necessarily the ones with most in favor, since if you look hard enough, you can usually find uh, 
uh, evidence that seems to support any hypothesis. That was one of the traps we fell into in 2002 in the run up to the Iraq war. We were so busy finding little fragments of evidence that appeared to point to Saddam Hussein's possession of WMD. Uh, we weren't looking so much for the evidence which might have contradicted that hypothesis, mm. unfortunately. Mm. And in explaining things, we're all human, unconscious emotional colouring of your explanation is very mm. common. It's almost impossible to avoid. Uh, we, we tend to uh, welcome evidence that suits us and push to one side evidence that doesn't suit our, our preferred explanation. But if you've got some data, you've got some pretty solid facts or something very close to them, then if you've got a good explanation, you can move on to the second E in C's, which is estimating how things might unfold. Uh, you can even model uh, if you've got a good explanation. And we see this with COVID-19. It's what the scientists are doing. They've got some data about the spread of the disease. They've got explanations of transmission of the disease. You put them together, you make some assumptions about human behavior and mask wearing and such like, and you come out with an estimate of how, say, the next month or two is likely to unfold. And so uh, the estimates part is answering questions about what will happen next if we do or we don't apply, take some decision or apply some policy intervention. And you need all three. You need the data, you need the explanation, and you need to make some assumptions. And very often, uh, I'm afraid it's the assumptions we make which tend to get out of date, but we haven't realized that. And then suddenly we discover life is not unfolding as we thought it, it might. The final part of C's is rather different because whilst we're all very busy worrying about uh, uh, all the information we need to decide exactly where to live, going to change house or whatever it might be, something else comes and hits us on the back of the head. We've been so absorbed in the task in hand that we haven't spotted from left field something will come and knock us off course. And so my final, the final S in C's is what I call strategic notice. So it's identifying future challenges to answer questions like how could we best prepare for some of the things that might hit us next or could we preempt this risk so that it never significantly materializes and this individual we do this all the time with insurance it's very unlikely our house is going to burn down if it did it would be pretty catastrophic um, we have strategic notice that uh, fires take place in kitchens so we probably install a smoke alarm there um, for moderate cost, it is possible to mitigate a lot of these uh, events, even if uh, you know that it's very unlikely they're actually going to transpire. And that's part of, uh, of good planning. And so my fourth lesson in intelligence, that's the fourth uh, letter of C's, is with strategic notice, you don't have to be so surprised by surprise. The fact that the fire has started will be a surprise, but you've prepared for it. It's not actually the strategic surprise that something coming completely out of the blue would be. So those are what I see as the four ra outputs you need from rational analysis of your situation. And then you've got to put that alongside as say the emotional side, the passionate side, your desires, what is it, do you know, your ambitions. Um, if you're deciding to change job, for example, and those are, you have to know those, you have to have them, but you also have to have this rather dispassionate, sort of sometimes cold blooded analysis of the situation uh, you're in. So that sees. Well, maybe, Sir David, we could juxtapose two uh, fairly obvious examples, one of a failure and one of a success. Um, you mentioned uh, Saddam Hussein's 
uh, WMDs, which as it turned out, didn't exist, but we went to war anyway over that issue. Um, but then there's the Falklands, which uh, the intelligence was used very presciently and urgently, it was taken seriously, um, and um, it was um, in your hands to give to Margaret Thatcher when she was Prime Minister, who immediately saw it as a, an existential threat to her to her government. Can you um, give us um, a little bit of a, a dance around both of those as a juxtaposition of uh, good use of data, bad use of data? Well, let's start with the Falklands. Uh, I was the principal private secretary to John Knott. He was the defence secretary. We were working together in the House of Commons on a speech he was going to give on a completely unrelated matter. And uh, a runner arrived from Whitehall to the House of Commons and with a locked pouch and in it were three intelligence reports that were from GCHQ, my old department. They uh, uh, were uh, intercepts uh, and deciphered inter intercepts of Argentine naval traffic. This is all in the domain now. And uh, what those intercepts meant, I'd worked in GCHQ, it was very obvious uh, that their explanation was that a task force had already set sail and was on its way to uh, Port Stanley to invade the take over the Falkland Islands. So uh, John and I rushed down the corridor uh, to the Prime Minister's office. Luckily she was in her office and we burst in and we showed her the intelligence reports. And this was on the Tuesday and we only had a few days. It was obvious that the, uh, it wouldn't take long for the invasion force to arrive. Uh, what that intelligence did was give her enough of a breathing space to gather together, you know, the first sea lord, the defence folk, the foreign policy folk, to work out what to do, to consult with the United States, try and get President Reagan to speak to General Galtieri to call off the invasion. He tried, by the way, very hard, but the Argentines wouldn't receive his call, rather for obvious yeah. reasons. Um, yeah. But what that uh, intelligence did was buy the time for her to prepare. So on the Saturday in a very, very agitated House of Commons, as angry a House of Commons as I can ever remember, um, mm. she was able to stand up and announce that a task force was being sent to the South Atlantic. Uh, which the first sea lord had said could be put together. And indeed, I had to leave her meeting on the Tuesday evening to go and ring the Ministry of Defence, the duty commander, to pass on the historic order of ready the fleet for sea. Um, these are sort of anecdotes that stick in your mind. But in a funny way, uh, so the, the intelligence saved Margaret Thatcher's premiership because if she'd yeah. been caught us by surprise, completely by surprise. That Saturday, I think the Conservative Party would have ditched her. They ditched Lord Carrington, but I think he, he was really felt he had to resign. But uh, Thatcher survived. But in a funny way, it also illustrates an intelligence failure. It's a failure of using of strategic notice because it was obvious negotiations were going on, discussions were going on about sovereignty with the Argentine. And the Joint Intelligence Committee had actually warned the government that if the Argentine junta came to the conclusion these negotiations were going nowhere, they might well resort to force. Um, but this is where magical thinking comes in. The, the government of the day, didn't do anything about it. For a relatively modest cost, they could have extended the runway at Port Stanley to take troop carrying aircraft. The invasion would not then have taken place. Uh, yeah. Probably uh, about three billion pounds would have been saved and about a thousand lives. But although they had the, str the strategic notice, they didn't act on it. So you could say it's a policy failure and an intelligence success. And certainly the task force would not have recovered the Falklands without the secret, the signals intelligence, which from then on uh, 
uh, fed the task force commander with just what he needed to know to conduct mm. the operations. So that's, if you like, a success, although it does also reflect a policy failure. Um, the 2002-2003 uh, run up to the Iraq war, serious flaws uh, were uh, the intelligence community did not get that right, either here or in the United States, or indeed in other major nations across Europe. Um, the assumption was that Saddam had retained WMD and was indeed developing it. Uh, he did, of course, have it, and the inspectors last previous time, first Gulf War, had indeed found it and had been horrified by how much of it they'd found. Uh, mm -hmm. So, again, this come back to this uh, uh, um, cognitive biases, because we were all thinking that he is obsessed with this uh, WMD. He needs it to keep his own country in order. He's used it against the Iranians. He needs it to frighten the Iranians as part of his deterrence. He's not going to give it up. And of course, we now know that he had at least temporarily suspended the programs because he wanted sanctions lifted. Um, he also, it's also clear, I think he would have resumed those programs once sanctions had been lifted uh, and we'd stopped the, having the no-fly zone over his country. Uh, so you, one mustn't exaggerate uh, the degree of failure. Some of the failure, and I go into this in some detail in the book, was that uh, a deliberate deception uh, and famous uh, case of an Iraqi uh, 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 refugee uh, who had worked on Saddam Hussein's biological warfare program when it did exist, um, turned up in Austria, the Germans uh, took him over and they debriefed him and he passed them information which he claimed was about Saddam's current biological yeah. warfare program. And the over almost a hundred reports were issued by the Germans. They went to the Americans, they went to the British and they were very influential in hardening the conviction that of course Saddam was concealing things and up to no good. So he said that that's just an example of where if you you see what you want to see and with hindsight perhaps people should have been more critical of that reporting but you know the Germans didn't allow any British or American analysts to to see this defector curveball. Mm. Um, you mm. had to take it on trust and of course it was information which appeared entirely technically plausible because he was a chemical engineer and he had worked on BW pro illegal BW programs. So he knew what he was talking mm. about. When the BBC ran him to earth when the war was over, he admitted it and said, well, we wanted Saddam uh, overthrown. Uh, I'm glad I did it essentially. So that's mm. just a little example of how you can get the reasoning wrong. Um, mm. And you can have, if you like, intelligence failures. That wasn't why, of course, Iraq was invaded. Iraq was not invaded because of any false intelligence. Iraq was invaded because the powers that be in Washington uh, wanted to remodel the Middle East in, in the neocon theories of uh, what a democratic Iraq might look like and how it could then alter the dynamics of tension, of, of, of conflict in that region turned out to be completely wrong. But nonetheless, uh, it wasn't really because of faulty intelligence. But we should have done much better, no doubt about that. Um, well, I guess we have the opportunity to do much better now. We're facing uh, the Chinese surveillance state, Russian disinformation, um, interference in the democratic processes of um, well, dem democratic countries, elections, Brexit, whatever. Um, what um, should we first off how about explaining what is the difference between disinformation and misinformation and how is it being deployed against um, uh, western style democracies and um, what tools do we have to be able to uh, counter the impact 
of 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 those actions uh, by what we can, I guess, call malign states. Um, and and uh, where do we go from here? Is it too late? No, the uh, great questions. Uh, there's a lot of this kind of activity goes on in what the Ministry of Defence calls the grey zone. In other words, it's not peace, but it's not war either. It's in this grey zone in between. Uh, and it's competition and sometimes rather brutal competition. Uh, and it does involve spreading disinformation, lies, forgeries. It's what we saw with the 2016 presidential election, uh, ensuring that Hillary Clinton did not become US president. Um, and in that gray zone, uh, as I say, you have uh, nowadays di what I call digital subversion. I mean, there's always been people attempts at uh, propaganda and forgery and so on, but in the digital world, it's much easier to do it and you can actually reach out and affect the attitudes of many, many more people. So it's much more dangerous thing these days than it ever used to be during, during the Cold War. Uh, and this is going to continue. I mean, the good news is that uh, NATO deterrence still works. Uh, I don't think Russia is going to contemplate any action directly against the NATO area. That's much too dangerous in the same way as uh, they didn't contemplate action against Berlin during the Cold War. It's really too dangerous to get into that kind of fight uh, with uh, the NATO nations. But in the grey zone, of course, the, the rules are different and you can uh, uh, try and uh, 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 unbalance your opponent, you can spread dissension, you can covertly back the, the right and the left uh, simultaneously, covertly, so that the country ends up fighting itself. And that's what we've seen in and see today in the United States. So it's, it, it's, a, it's a real, it's a real problem. Now, I, <laughs> There are three kinds of activity going on. There's what you could you call misinformation. And that's information which is untrue, it's false, but it wasn't thought to be false when it was put into circulation. And politicians do this all the time, so do journalists, and so indeed do academics. You get it wrong. Mm. And a decent politician will correct the record a little statement to the House of Commons, uh, something written in Hansard, which will say, I'm sorry, the answer I gave wasn't correct. Here's the correct answer. So you can correct misinformation and you should correct misinformation. Disinformation, on the other hand, is material that's known to be false when you spread it. So it's a lie uh, or uh, at least a half truth. Um, it's uh, s spread deliberately uh, to deceive. There's a third category which uh, our Russian friends have really specialized in, which is known as malinformation. And that's information which is actually true, but was never intended to be public. So you hack into the uh, servers of Macron's En Marche party just before the French uh, presidential election, you steal his emails and you publish them through WikiLeaks. It's called weaponizing information. And the Russians did the same to the Democratic Party in the United States, quite a, you know, mildly embarrassing material, when, which was never intended to be public. Uh, between leading figures in the Democratic Party, you hack in, you steal the emails, and again, you make them public to pursue your, your agenda, to make trouble for the other side. Um, and oh, misinformation uh, is, is always going to be with us, but it can be dealt with, it can be corrected, and you can apply, I hope, a certain amount of pressure on public figures that when they misspeak, they really have to correct the record. Um, just because of figures on the side of a bus about Brexit and the National Health Service, that figure turned out to be wrong. People should be apologising for that and 
making it clear. That <laughs> I hope they didn't know it was wrong when they first put it up on the bus, but once people had started to point out it was wrong, at that point it becomes disinformation because it hasn't been corrected. I hope I'm not offending too many well, people um, in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. <laughs> um, we um, we think of uh, the uh, people who are young, let's say um, in their thirties and younger than that, as being very tech savvy. Um, they've grown up um, almost umbilically attached to their devices, and it's not like the jokes that um, people used to make about not being able to program their VCR recorders. Now it's it's just like mother's milk. And yet you were mentioning to me the other day that you don't find young people to be savvy about the information that they put online. So we're really at a point where if education about misinformation, disinformation, malinformation um, and um, all the uh, tools that we have in an arsenal for combating that and informing ourselves so that we take the passion out and put the rationality in exist, but they're not being utilised. Um, where are we heading, Sir David? Are we, are we going to remain in this black hole of, of um, informational vulnerability or is there a solution to help us combat the adversaries who are taking advantage of us in this way? I mean, the short answer, I suppose, it, uh, I'm an optimist and I think we can invest in, in uh, education and I would make critical thinking and being safe on the internet, I would make these compulsory subjects from quite a young age in schools uh, because young people are exposed to a lot of very malign material online uh, and they, uh, because of anonymity on the internet, they may well get into some quite deep internet relationships and they don't know the people on the other end of the line. Uh, so they've got to be taught about that. Um, I think it's good that they should know quite a lot about uh, how the internet and the web actually work. I mean, my experience with some of the students that I teach is that they are very tax tech savvy in that they know how to use all this stuff in the same way as they would know how to drive a motor car. But if you ask mm -hmm. them, open the bonnet of a modern motor car and say, now talk me through what's in here, they would probably struggle. Uh, I think probably of my generation, I'm what, coming up for 74, uh, most kids would know, you know, this is a carburetor, <laughs> this, uh, this is the fuel pump. These mm. things you don't mm. see. It's the technology of modern motor cars. It's a lot of it's digital control. It's moved on. And so they have these extraordinary devices and we all have them, the mobile phones and the tablets and so on. Have they any idea how they work? No. Um, and some knowledge of that is needed if you're going to then protect yourself in the right kind of ways mm -hmm. against uh, uh, malware and uh, ransomware and, uh, and such like. And the same is true of the wider internet. When you think about it, it is a higher form of magic that with a mobile phone, you can just dial a number and get somebody on the other side of the world one of about two and a half similarly equipped people on the planet, two and a half billion people with the same kind of device mm. and seamlessly mm. tap in the number and through goes the call or type in uh, their email address. That is a truly remarkable uh, achievement. It comes, of course, with a downside. Um, the upside is very obvious, our economy is dependent on it. How would we manage in COVID if we didn't have the connectivity we're actually using as we speak? Um, mm. You know, mm. there's no going back. This is the future. We're 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 in the future, um, but it does have this downside. I have a another acronym in addition to C's, which is cesspit. Good old-fashioned English word. <laughs> 
crime, <laughs> espionage, sabotage, subversion, perverting internet technology. Um, and there's a lot mm. of cyber crime around. Um, there yeah. is a lot of intelligence activity that takes place uh, digitally. Um, you've got digital uh, subversion. Um, and these are serious societal problems uh, and we have to defend ourselves against them. And in the book, I've tried to set out a little agenda for how we could, you know, with luck, uh, come 10 years time, we'll look back and say, yeah, we took the right decisions then, we invested in our, our resilience, uh, we're now much better off than we would have been otherwise. Mm. Um, well, thank you, Sir David. I think it's time that we took some questions. Yeah. We've got quite a list of people who want to um, ask for your um, intelligence. Um, and the first person I'm going to call on is uh, Janet Berridge, a past chair of the NLC. Janet, what's your question to Sir David? Can you hear us, Janet? Nothing from Janet. Okay, well, let's move on. Um, Hello. Lord Tim oh, Clement Jones. I've, I've, oh, no, there you are. There you are. <laughs> I couldn't unmute myself. The host had to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> What's your question, Janet? Yeah. That was most interesting, Sir David. Um, what I found uh, so very interesting is your uh, definition of mis, dis, and mal information. Um, you didn't ins uh, you didn't offend me about the, your comments about the bus, uh, the information on the side of the bus, because I'm a, Remo a Remainer. I nearly said Ramona. Um, uh, Brexit has happened, and and I know there's nothing we can do it, uh, about it at the moment. But the one thing that really makes me so angry about the whole Brexit thing was um, I believe that that number on the side of the bus was definitely. A fantasy, uh, as were a lot of other facts that we were told. Um, and being a Liberal Democrat, uh, I uh, campaigned very actively and openly before the referendum. And we produced literature that said, this is not true, that's not true. That's a um, whole leaflets full of what we believed were was the truth. Um, against what um, the Leave campaign were putting out. Um, but all we got was, we were told we were peddling um, Project Fear. How is it, I mean, in that case, it was very difficult because a lot of people in the government were on the side of Leave. But I mean, even this late point, how, if you have a press who 75% uh, or 80% of which has been peddling those lies along with the leave campaign how do you then at a later date say this is not uh it wasn't true and and we want to set the record straight how are we ever going to get uh, the truth on on brexit well um <laughs> as a former civil servant i'm <laughs> still try and preserve a sort of certain um professional neutrality as it were so just on the facts of the matter you're absolutely right that a lot of things were said in that campaign that at the time you might have said well that really is magical thinking um, there's a real problem there and I haven't seen the Brexiters come up with a solution and the classic case there is Northern Ireland and the near torpedoing of peace on the island of Northern Ireland, um, which had to be retrospectively worked out. Now, um, th that I think is a very good example where what we, what we need is obviously the critical thinking to identify this sort of issue. And then uh, if you want your side of the argument, to have the same kind of sway as the other side, you've got to get modern. And this is where the Remainer arguments, the, the Remainer campaign fell down. It was not using the 
reach of social media in the same way as the Brexiters were. Now, moving away slightly from Brexit, just to the more general point, that I think the last couple of years have been a huge wake-up call for the political class and indeed people generally about the business model of the internet. You know, why is it Google f searching free at the point of search? Why don't you have to pay a subscription? Uh, and the answer is it's the advertising that pays for it. And yeah. advertising revenues, which are in the tens, if not hundreds of billions globally, this is what pays for all the connectivity that we're using at the moment, the internet itself and, and, and the web. And what the advertising technology does is it is running behind the scenes markets in which you have a marketplace for those who want to advertise a product or a service. Um, and the market, you pay more for, uh, or you pay less rather for uh, material uh, ad uh, advertising uh, or publicity material, which is going to attract more clicks. Um, and you have a marketplace in which the suppliers, the, the, the tech companies and the uh, companies that want to advertise their goods and services, you are arbitrating. So when you click on a web page, don't be surprised that the advertisement that pops up is one that they know in advance is more likely to fit you, your income group, your sex, your gender rather, your uh, past buying habits, your innermost thoughts because they have access to uh, your web browsing. So if you're thinking of a holiday when COVID is over, and you've been browsing lots of uh, uh, adventurous skiing holidays, those are the investments which will come. And even if you go mm -hmm. to a, uh, 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 one of the intermediate companies that are, are package holidays or whatever, they will already know all about you. And this was one of the tricks that the uh, Brexiters had realized that you could target messages and of course, once you can do that for products and services, which you have to do, that's the commercial world we're in, you can do it with political messages and it's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So you are tuning your message to what you believe the supporters you're trying to rally and get them out on the street are wanting to hear. And this is, of course, is what the Trump base, this is why Trump has a base is because of the exploitation of this uh, technology. There's nothing you can do about it. We can't do without the internet. Some greater regulation breaking up some of the tech companies um, uh, uh, with, with monopoly powers and so on. Um, but essentially you've got to accept. It. Now in political terms, this is creates some very interesting issues in you know, not so long ago, um, if you wanted to put out a political message, you had to go to television and buy a television spot, or you had to put up a hoarding or an advertisement in a newspaper. And anyone passing would see the same message and the same hoarding. You don't do that on the internet. The message is tuned to the group you're trying to reach. So you can send in theory, completely opposite messages to different groups. So for the urban uh, uh, sophisticates, if you're a Brexiter, you can push out one message. And for the fishermen, you can push out a different message. And these don't get compared and contrasted because they're actually going straight into the inboxes of those groups. And the, it's not personal in the sense of your name, but you are identified as being somebody with the following, well, Cambridge Analytica claimed to have a thousand different characteristics on file for every American yeah. voter. So, you know, this is, you know, wake up everyone. Um, this is what is going on. And yeah. if you want to win a political argument, then 
this is the kind of world um, you know you've got to swim in. Uh, I'm exaggerating a bit, obviously, um, and I'm not. Uh, yeah. You can't be a permanent secretary in Whitehall and be politically naive. So there's always been a bit of argy bargy in politics, and there's always been a bit of exaggeration of the benefits of this policy or that. That that's not new. Mm. But what is new mm. is the kind of speed and reach uh, of internet-based yeah. communication. Thank you very much, Sir Dave. Um, Yes, thank you, Janet, for your question. Um, I can recommend um, a Netflix movie called um, "Social: uh, The Social Dilemma," which um, highlights the 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 algorithmic uh, dominance of the of the sites that you'll be seeing. Um, for our next question, um, Lord Tim Clement Jones, can I ask you please to keep your question very brief? We've got a lot of people waiting and not much time left. I'll and try also, and keep the answers, to David. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if you could, that would be great. So we can cram in as much as possible. Go ahead, Lord Tim. Lynn, thanks very much indeed. And I just wanted to follow up to David on the digital side, because I speak in the House on uh, digital issues. I'm on the risk uh, assessment and risk planning select committee, which uh, I'm telling them that it's required reading uh, your book, uh, particularly the last chapter on the sort of digital resilience um, aspect. Um, you may have seen the uh, democracy and digital uh, report um, of the select committee last year from David Putnam's select committee. He's come back in the fray in the light of the violence in Washington. And he's, um, uh, uh, I just quote what he said, governments must hold online platforms accountable for the content of their algorithms and promote and empower citizens to assert their rights online. And this would support our democracy instead of underlining it. I mean, is this really the crucial thing that the government should be doing? I mean, you know, do you think they're actually aware of the need to do this? Yeah. <laughs> He he's on to a really important point, um, but it's not straightforward, uh, you know, to see quite how you turn this into into legislation. Um, are these tech companies editors? Are they in the publishing business? So what is their responsibility for what is carried on their channels? They started off a few years ago, as you remember, the uh, simply saying we manage pipes. We have no interest in what passes down our pipes. We just keep the pipes um, in, in working order. That argument was blown out of the water, essentially by the uh, campaign against child pornography. And, and then the advertisers, and this is another point worth making, the big advertisers started pulling their advertisements from Facebook and other platforms because they weren't prepared to take the risk that the advertisement for their high class product would appear on the same web page as some absolutely disgraceful um, uh, piece. So uh, that forced Facebook to start and the other uh, companies uh, beginning to monitor what was going on. But of course, the volume is so colossal that you can't do this in real time with human beings. You've got to write these algorithms. And then you get into the counter examples, which are seized on that uh, a perfectly innocent photograph of uh, that's that sent, uh, you know, we've all had them, you know, baby in the bath the algorithm will say here is child without clothes bang the whole lot mm. so you're banned from the platform and then you've got to go through some rigmarole to, to get reinstated so it's not entirely easy and straightforward but i think the the, the basic point is right you we have to find some way of putting responsibility on these companies um the other thing that they're doing, of course, is they have moderators and they have people scanning material when it's pointed out. That is probably about the most stressful and PTSD inducing activity. Uh, the lifespan, I'm told, is about six months before people blow up because you can't sit there watching the most disgusting aspects of human behavior you know, for 12 hours a day. Uh, they're tending to employ people in low wage labor areas. 
to do this kind of work, a bit like call centers, um, that's not a sustainable solution. So probably it has to be the technology that will uh, in the end police this, but there'll be a bit of nibbling away at free speech inevitably. And then, you know, somehow or other, we'll have to arrive at a balance that, you know, parliament thinks is about right. I don't think you can do it quickly. I think it's going to take years to evolve where we need to get to on this. Thank you very much indeed, David. Mm. Mm, thank you. Um, plumbers or publishers? <laughs> question of the moment. Our next question um, goes to uh, Brian Williams. Are you there, Brian? Yes, I am actually. Good morning, everyone. I'm calling from Australia. Okay. It's a lovely morning. The, the, the sparrows haven't have not <laughs> finished uh, digesting yet, to be honest. Um, my, question is probably a, Let alone. <laughs> my question to Sir David is probably um, a, a follow on from the previous comment. Um, it's all well and good. The, the social media platforms are, are very good with their algorithms of, of pushing advertising in particular ways, but they certainly are not being held account or they are in, in piecemeal fashion in a number of jurisdictions for, for what they actually do put across and actively manipulate, I, I talk about rather than passively manipulate, but I'm talking about actively manipulate for the purposes of um, helping their advertising customers to get more eyeballs on screen. Is it time for that? for not just a, an EU or a British, is it, we're talking time for a, a worldwide um, movement to start saying, well, if you want to play in this space and you want to be utilized to manipulate and to change people's opinions, then you have to be held to account. You're not just, you can't just put your hands up and say, oh, we're just a commercial organization. We're not government focused. Um, is that something we should look at as a, a, a worldwide movement rather than just piecemeal yeah i there are i'm told discussions going on um there are various un fora my hunch is that it's going to be many years before you could get a consensus uh, together and russia and china want to separate out their internet anyway um so you've got a, a bit of a difficulty getting uh, them are uh, uh, on board. There are some small steps you could take. I mean, it wouldn't be so difficult to uh, have uh, legislation that if you put out a message, a uh, political message, you know, via social media or whatever, that all those messages have to have the return address, which can be verified by the company. Mm -hmm. So there isn't uh, an anonymous message. You know who paid for this input. That would have been actually quite interesting during the Brexit debate to know exactly who <laughs> investigative journalists would then have been able to follow up who was actually paying for this stuff. Um, so that's one small step you could take to increase uh, accountability. But you're right. I mean, we've got to start talking about this subject uh, internationally as well. No one nation can can I think reach a solution on this because it's a it's a global phenomenon. Thanks, Sir David. Um, uh, our next question goes to David uh, Furbrug. Fer and um, please excuse me if I'm mispronouncing okay. your name, David. Please go ahead. And could you keep it? Let's keep things brief. We haven't got a lot of time left. Let's cram in as much as we can. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, so. I'm interested in crystal ball gazing a little here. Yeah. So I used to chat to Chris Painter over at State many years ago when we used to say the internet's a global commons. But it seems like there's more and more balkanization and separation occurring. And I wanted to get your views if you projected forward a little bit of that fragmentation of the internet and what we're actually seeing and what that may mean in terms of the technology and social media companies as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, one of the points I make in the book is that uh, along with other people at folk from the intelligence world that you've worked with, David, <laughs> we try and avoid the word prediction because we haven't got a crystal ball. And there's no point in uh, uh, trying to persuade some government minister that you know what's going to happen. Because yeah. So estimates within defined ranges and words like probably and very probably and so on. Very disciplined, but, David. Yeah, no, no, it's essential, I think. It's essential. But coming to your, your, your main, your, the thrust of your, your, your question, 
I think it's inevitable that uh, the big China in particular, because of uh, and Russia as well, we're seeing this with Iran, North Korea is a special case. They are not prepared to have our global internet penetrate their societies. It's a culture war and they're not prepared to have our culture. So they, they are in a sense trying to break away. They will set their own standards. That's going to affect global connectivity. It will have some downside, I suspect, in things like global commerce, because you aren't necessarily always going to get the straight through, a bit like the arguments with Brexit and uh, commerce, single market rules and so on. You're going to get some friction um, in the connectivity between these different internet. I do hope we can all work to pull together, if you like, the the liberal democracies should share an internet space um, with open source, open code, as it were. The, the protocols are, are there. They can be argued about openly. It doesn't become proprietary pop property of any giant corporation. Um, it, the potential for uh, economic and social development of that future internet, I think is phenomenal. And it's really going to benefit the uh, global South because it's the youngster, you know, somewhere in Africa who's got access via the internet to the world's best teachers from Stanford and Oxford and Cambridge and so on, because they're all online, the lectures are online, the courses are online. That's going to create a new generation that I think is enormously empowered. So I think that's absolutely great. Um, I suspect we've just got to write off China and Russia. They're going to go their own way. Regardless. Thank you. Um, thanks for your question. Um, our next uh, question comes from uh, Robin Ashby. You there, Robin? Yes. Hello. Good evening, David. It's always uh, nice there to be here. Metaphorically, uh, sit at your feet. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I want you to take up your a point you made. Uh, don't be surprised by surprise, uh, and and in particular in the in the current uh, disaster that we have. Uh, well over a decade ago, I sat in the civil uh, contingency secretariat. I was told that th their biggest fear was not an existential threat to the UK or terrorism or anything. It was a pandemic. Um, my local uh, nursing home. Um, saw the news from Wuhan and went out and bought extra PPE and they bought iPads so their old people could talk to their relatives before the government even lifted a finger. Uh, so it, none of this was rocket science. How do you get, uh, and in, with your, your experience as a, as a, as a, in government, how do you get uh, ministers, etc., uh, and, and, the, and the, the mechanisms of government to think and talk, talk and take notice of the kind of forward thinking that's being done in, the, in this way for, from people like, for instance, civil contingencies. Yeah, um, it's a very good point. The, I, when I was in the cabinet office as uh, security intelligence coordinator, one of, one of the things that we decided to do was to publish the government's risk register and to publish those matrices with likelihood along one axis and impact if it happens along the other. And you're absolutely right. The ones that I was uh, involved in all had the pandemic in the top right-hand corner of the most threatening combination of likelihood and impact. Um, the, the, the surprise comes because you can't predict you know, in some zoonotic disease, it's going to have slightly different characteristics from the previous one. So there's an element of surprise when it does actually happen. But a lot of the basics of investment in resilience, as you point out, you could do for any pandemic. So I was a bit startled by the problems that were run into immediately on PPE, for example why the stockpiles weren't as in the condition they perhaps should have been, given the strategic warning that uh, uh, governments had had over 15 years. Um, the contingency planning in the health service seems to have worked very well because that was regularly rehearsed. Uh, but there are other areas that perhaps 
hadn't been worked through. Um, I, the 2008 financial crash and disaster probably, and the squeeze on public expenditure, which may or may not have been necessary, I'm not qualified to say, but assuming it was necessary, it certainly hit the amount of money that was being spent on resilience. And that may have been one of the reasons why, well, only know when there's an inquiry, no doubt when all this is over, and you go back over the books as to why some of, some of these things didn't work out quite as we might have hoped. But the arrangements I'm sure you were involved in, setting up SAGE, said having people on standby, expertise already identified, uh, some dormant contracts, the arrangements which had been made to accelerate the production of vaccine, for example. I mean, years of work had gone in uh, by the medical profession with the companies in in looking ahead, because although you might not know exactly what you're going to produce, shortening that time. So it's patchy. Some of it seemed to work very well, others less so. But your basic point is absolutely right, that one thing to give the strategic warning, somehow you've got to have some process that uh, ensures it gets turned into action. Um, thanks, David, and thanks for your um, your question. Um, Ewan Grant is our next interlocutor. Are you there, Ewan? Yeah, um, you got me? Yeah, can yes, you can hear you hear you loud and clear. Can't see you, but that's all right. the top of your head. Yeah. Oh, right, Go sorry, I think that... Ewan. Okay, yeah. right. Well, I, um, I hey, thought the video was on. There you are. Yeah, very Welcome. short. Let's yes, keep it um, brief. Um, yeah. Um, many years ago, I taught the um, John F. Kennedy case to um, trainees. And so I can well understand the importance of Sir David's comment about the emotional crowding out the rational. My question, Sir David, follows on from Robin Ashby's. Um, who is listening to the message of the book? and who isn't, and, and who means organizations, and why aren't they listening? And as somebody said, um, required reading, must have, well, I think that's one of the understatements of the year. Uh, it's certainly on my Kindle. Thank you. Well, th th thanks for those kind words about the, about the book. Um, I used to have a, a the, uh, I used to call it the railway sleeper theory of progress, where it's like trying to build a railway over a swamp. And with enormous effort, you have great railway, wooden railway sleepers, and you throw them into the swamp and they sink. But if you keep going long enough and you throw in enough of them, you can get enough, you know, purchase to actually put out the railroad tracks. Um, so no one uh, book is going to uh, change the world, uh, not this book. But I hope it will contribute to people just being a little more conscious that the, you know, there are some important issues here. And the digital world, for example, is still developing at extraordinary speed. We haven't talked about the Internet of Things and 5G. Uh, the, uh, you know, we're still in quite a dangerous world. And there are threats out there that we have to really uh, think about and mitigate the risks that they represent. And that takes us into all these issues that we, uh, social media, internet communications, how much of our privacy are we prepared to surrender uh, to allow the monitoring of what is going on? Uh, at what point do we say, no, that taking us too far to the Chinese state? I really don't want the government knowing that information, even if it's for the most you know, uh, beneficial uh, sorts of purposes. So there are going to be plenty of issues like that around in the future that we're going to. I think the key to it all is open debate. I encourage investigative journalism as long as you know, they have to exercise some self-restraint sometimes. But as a whole, it does help keep government honest. Um, discussion groups like yours, uh, 
if people are talking about these issues, then that's a good first step in trying to think through how we're going to cope when they really do come to the boil. Indeed. Um, thank you. And our last questioner, we only have time for one more, is Humphrey Hawksley. Are you there, Humphrey? I am, Lynn. Thank you. Um, um, fascinating mm, stuff. Welcome. Yes. I just wondered, David, if you, you, you mm. talked about the the yeah. roles between policy making and intelligence gathering. Double on that. And I wonder if you could explain how those roles were when we went from the uh, from the explosion that happened in Iraq to probably predictable stuff that happened in Libya, the Egypt uprising, and then Syria, and how the intelligence and policy making meshed, or there was there. And then I'm particularly interested in this because we now have this other monster looming, which is China. So a couple of years ago, we were in a golden era with China, and now it's a Marxist-Leninist state. So there's a narrative there. And I wondered if you could give us an idea of how the intelligence gathering, the assumptions and the policy making all work together in situations like this. Uh, I, 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 it's a great question. It'd take me some time to develop it all. Let me just give a part of an answer, which is that unlike the situation when uh, in 2003, when we uh, joined the United States in uh, invading Iraq, we now have a National Security Council. So, uh, you know, this is not so for government. This is a properly constituted committee of the cabinet chaired by the prime minister with all the right people on it. The chief of defense staff is in attendance, as are the heads of the three agencies and the chair of the Joint Intelligence Committee. So there is there the, a very straightforward channel for thinking about uh, intelligence and say some developing situation. And the, uh, the ministers who, uh, collectively are going to have to take a view on what to do and I think it seems to be working rather well um, the trouble is we've we've had so many crises that have kind of given a short-term focus I suspect they haven't really had the bandwidth to think too far ahead to the kind of issue you were raising for example in relation to our future relationship with China but I hope that's exactly the kind of issue that will both have an intelligence picture but will also have uh, some quite deep policy analysis of what this means for the UK for our commercial relationships with China and uh, for our security relationships but having it all together in a National Security Council uh, it is, I think, probably the, the wisest uh, approach. Uh, it doesn't guarantee you're going to get the right discussion, but at least it's got the process there. And, you know, there are some very bright people around still in, in Whitehall, and I think they can make it make it work. Great. Well, um, thank you, Sir David. Thank you so much for your time and for your eloquence and for answering so many curly questions and um, for uh, scaring the wits out of us. Here we are um, hoping to hold on to our freedoms at the same time as being um, battered from from all sides. Um, I'm going to um, pass over now to Samaya Ali, who's going to give the vote of thanks. And um, before I do that, please accept my thanks to um, you and to everyone who participated. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Lynn. Thank you, thank you so much, Lynn. And thank you, um, Professor David, for such an insightful and intriguing talk. Um, your astute explanation on the use of rational analysis in a situation um, alongside the emotional aspects really demonstrates the interwoven nature of both in a personal, professional and a global capacity, um, which is, of course, all the more interesting coming from someone with a background such as yours. So um, in this spirit, I'd like to extend my thanks on behalf of myself, Noel Hadji Michael and the National Liberal Club to Professor Sir David Ormond for honouring us with your thoughts and insights into the world of intelligence. 
And thank you for all those who have participated today. And hopefully the next time we meet, they'll be in a more sociable context. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for those for those words. And please, uh, my my best wishes to you all and stay safe. <laughs>